Welcome. My name is Jeff Wyma, and I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. Most of you watching this video have uh, watched the previous ones in which we've been exegeting, we've been interpreting an important passage of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And we did that first and foremost to illustrate a hermeneutic, a reformed way of interpreting the Bible. But now we've marked out from that discussion one particular topic entitled the rapture. And I've done so for two reasons. One, because the rapture is an important subject, a subject about which there is, I'm afraid, a lot of confusion. And so I think it's helpful to kind of mark this out as a, as a subject worthy of its own independent treatment. And also because a number of the things that we have to talk about in answering what the Bible says about the rapture involve not just one or two of our hermeneutical categories, but involves a number of them. And so we can see in this discussion that it's a bit artificial to separate them all out into independent five categories, but often they overlap with each other. Nevertheless, it is helpful to separate them out so that they don't become confused in our mind and we think about them in a more conscious way on whatever passage of Scripture we happen to be either teaching or preaching or interpreting. Well, let's turn then to a, 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 a topic in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, which deals with the rapture. The two key verses in our passage are found in verses 16 and 17 and go like this. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So here is, in my mind anyway, the clearest for sure, and I would also argue the only passage in the Bible that directly or explicitly raises the topic of the rapture. And the question is now, is this a biblical idea or is it a mistaken identity? And it can't be because the answer can't come because of what we like or what we want the Bible to say. It can't be of some scholar who says this or that. No, it has to be sola scriptura. It has to be based on what the scriptures alone say. And it has to be based on a right dealing of scripture. That is, in other words, dealing with scripture according to this appropriate reformed hermeneutic that we have been talking about for some time. So here we start off with some soft evidence. Now, I wouldn't call it soft unless I had somewhere down the road some hard evidence. So if you're not convinced by the soft evidence, I'm not so bothered. But it is relevant to the discussion, and so let's start here. And that is that this verse seems to describe Jesus coming in a more public way. We hear about Jesus coming how? With a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. If you did a word study on that phrase with a loud command, you would, this would be a grammatical approach, by the way, you would find out that it would be a command given by what? A captain of a ship to his rowers. Or it would be given by a general to his army. So this word always has the sense of a loud and authoritative cry. We have the reference to the voice of the archangel. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence about archangels speaking, so it's hard to make some conclusions about that. But the last thing there, I think, is helpful to note with the trumpet call of God. There are other passages of Scripture, of course, that talk about the return of Jesus being marked by the sound of a trumpet. But at this point, I simply want to make home the important point that a trumpet, out of all the different instruments available in the ancient world, and still today, is not a soft instrument. A trumpet is very, very loud. So when you look at these uh, three prepositional phrases, you know, the natural way, the kind of somewhat simplistic, or I would say naive way, I mean, that may not be the right way always, but the natural way of reading the text is that Jesus will come back in a public way, right? With a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, the rather significant, loud, distinctive sound of a trumpet. And this suggests that Jesus' coming will be what? It will not be a secret coming, as some argue. I trust you're familiar with the idea of the rapture, the idea that Jesus will have not one coming, but two comings. There'll be a secret coming in which just all the Christians will vanish and disappear. Then there'll be a time of tribulation, seven years. And then after that, Jesus will come 
with his saints. But here, at least the text seems to suggest a public coming in which all people, not just Christians, but non-Christians too, will witness. Now, those on the other side may say, and I guess they could say, oh, Christians will hear all of these things, you know, they'll have ears to hear all of these events, it'll be a public event for them, but for non-Christians, they'll miss it all. I suppose that's possible, that's a possible way to read this text, but, you know, a lot of things are possible, but not always probable, and that's not, again, the natural way of reading this text. So the first evidence, it's soft evidence, it's not definitive or decisive, but it is relevant. The first evidence uh, about the rapture is that it will be some kind of public coming of Jesus. Second soft evidence. Again, I call it soft because I've got, must have some hard evidence coming. And that has to do with a key verb. The verb will be caught up. The Greek verb harpazo was translated in the Latin Vulgate by the verb rapare. And from the verb rapare, we get the noun rapture. So the word in English rapture comes from this verse out of the whole Bible, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. It comes basically then from this Greek verb harpazo. Now, if you did a word study on harpazo, you would discover something interesting you would discover that it's a word that was used with some frequency by secular letter writers of that day to describe what? How people were snatched. You could translate it caught up, if you will. But people were grabbed or snatched or caught up from life to death. You can see a reference there to Plutarch, an important ancient author. And you can see there a number of references in his writings where he uses the verb in that way. One example I have is that people who die in early death, that they are snatched from, right? They are cut up from the advantages of life, such as marriage, education, manhood, citizenship, and public office. Funeral inscriptions, right? So either inscriptions that we find on text or on graves speak about how fate has harpazo. It's raptured. It's snatched away the living to the place of Hades, to the underground. And you can see, again, a number of references about how this verb in Greek, harpazo, was used. And yet another writer, Lucian, uses a synonym of Arpazzo to talk about a grieving father who says about his dead son, Dearest child, you are gone for me, snatched, right? Raptured, if you will, caught up, uh, you know, from, 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 from your time, from the time of your earthly existence. Now, if you know that this is how the word was used typically by secular letters of that day, This might open up the possibility that Paul is deliberately choosing this word as a kind of pun, as a kind of inversion on a common use of the word in that day. Now, wait a minute. You first of all have to be convinced that Paul is a skilled letter writer and capable of this kind of clever punning. I hope that that, that's clear to you. Right? There are all kinds of evidence that, that Paul was an extremely gifted guy intellectually, but he was especially a gifted letter writer. He thought very carefully, again, not just about what he was saying, but how he would say it. And he was more than capable of taking a word and making a pun on it. And so Paul's pun would be, wait a minute, we live in a world in which we regularly hear on gravestones and on secular letter writing, uh, we regularly hear about people are raptured, they are hapazod in Greek, they are caught up from life to death. And Paul may be cleverly inverting this common verb to say, wait a minute, On the day of Jesus' return, people are going to be caught up from life to, well, not to death, but to life or to a different form of life. The idea that they don't face death at all. And so the consequence of this would be is that Paul didn't mean this word to be interpreted literally, or at least in the sense of the way that it's commonly understood by dispensationalist or left-behind folks today. But he chose this word in order to cleverly invert an understanding of a common verb of that day. Well, 
Even if you're not convinced of this, again, I'm not worried, because after this soft evidence, I finally bring out not just the hard evidence, but I would say to you the rock-hard evidence. I would suggest to you that this next discussion I'm going to have is so convincing it actually delivers a death blow to the far too common idea that Christians will just, what, when Jesus returns? They're going to be raptured, they will vanish and disappear for a period of seven years, they'll have the marriage feast of the Lamb while the tribulation takes place here on earth, and then we come back to earth for a period of Christ's millennial reign, thousand years, and those other events that happen after that. So what is this rock-hard evidence that delivers a death blow to that idea of the rapture? Well, it involves a word in English, anyway, that doesn't look very important, but in Greek it is. We read in verse 17 that we will be caught up to what? The Lord in the air to meet, to meet. Now, in English, the word to meet is not a very powerful word or exciting word. You may have meetings and you're not very excited about that, but, but that's not at all the meaning of this word. In Greek, the word is apontasis, apontasis. And first of all, it's a technical term. A technical term means it's a special word that has a special meaning. All right? And what is this special meaning that this word always has? Well, in that day, if, a, if an important person were coming to your town... And it'd have to be an important person, like the emperor or the governor of the province or maybe an important Roman general. But if an important figure were coming to your town, what would happen? Well, the city leaders would get all excited and say, oh, emperor so-and-so is coming or governor so-and-so is coming. And they would first likely pass a, a decree uh, acknowledging on the public records, you know, the great honor that our city has by the visit of emperor so-and-so or governor so-and-so or general so-and-so. And then the city leaders would pick a group of people, right? They would pick a delegation party. And whom would they pick? They would pick, obviously, the movers and the shakers, people with the brains and the bucks. You know, it would be a privileged position. And they would send this group of people down the road to Apontasis, right? To meet this emperor, to meet this governor, or to meet this general. And then what would happen when the delegation party met, or we might call it better, the reception party meets this person? Would they do a U-turn and this general or this emperor or this governor would go back to where they came from? Of course not. Obviously, the reception party, this delegation party, would escort this important figure to the place he was always going, the place from which the members of the delegation party came. You can see some of the details here about this apontasis. And the Christians in Thessaloniki would have surely seen a couple of these in their lifetime. Thessaloniki qualifies as one of the top ten cities in the ancient world. It also had an especially close relationship with Rome and the Roman Empire. And it was visited on a number of occasions by either the Roman emperor, the governor of the province of Macedonia, or by other figures. And so people in the city would have been well aware of these apontasis, these reception or delegation parties. Now think about the imagery because it's always the same outside of Scripture. The delegation party goes down the road to meet the important person and then escorts them to the place they were always going, the place from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. And this is true not only for the meaning of this word outside of the Bible, it's also true for the meaning of this word in its three New Testament occurrences. One of those, obviously, is our passage. That means there's two more outside of Thessalonians. Let's go to those passages before we come back to ours. By the way, we're not only doing grammatical, but also theological and kind of with the principle of interpreting Scripture with Scripture. So, so here in uh, Matthew 25, verse 6, we meet in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. We read about how they go down the road to what? to apontasis, to meet the bridegroom. So what happens when they meet the bridegroom? Do they take off with them on the honeymoon? Of course not. The wedding hasn't even happened yet, right? They, they escort the bridegroom to the place he was going, namely the wedding, the place from which they came. The picture is quite clear. You go out, you receive, and you escort this person the last part of their journey. 
Same thing is true of the Apostle Paul and his journey to Rome, his so-called captive or prison journey described in Acts 28. In verse 15, we read about how the Christians in Rome heard that Paul is coming. They say, Paul is coming. And so they send a delegation party, a reception party, down the Roman road to meet, to Apontasis, the Apostle Paul. And what happens when they meet Paul? Do they escape with Paul? Do they run away with the, the Apostle? Of course not. They escort him to the place that he was always going, Rome, the place from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. So again, the picture in those other passages of the New Testament are exactly the same in all the secular letter writers of that day and therefore, I think, have important consequence for our passage. So now we turn to verse 17 and we again hear those words, to what the Lord? To meet the Lord, upon Tasis. And so the picture that Paul paints for the Thessalonians is really that, a picture, first of all, right? It's a metaphor. It describes a common practice of that day of a delegation party going out to meet an important dignitary. Except for the Thessalonians, this is exciting because instead of the movers and the shakers of the city, it's going to be them. And how exciting this must have been for them. For the fact that their fellow citizens, which Thessalonians says, persecuted them, ridiculed them, thought they were crazy for believing in this Jesus. Oh, how these Christians in Thessaloniki were looking forward to the day when they would be proven to be true. And what's more, they were looking to the glory of the other events that would accompany Christ's return. They were eagerly anticipating. And so Paul holds out for them in a comforting way this glorious picture that the church then that they, not only the church in Thessaloniki, but obviously the whole body of Christ, those who are living, along with those who have died and then been resurrected and transformed. So the whole church then is the delegation party that meets the Lord in the air. The air is important too, because in the ancient world, the air was believed to be the place where the demons and the evil spirits controlled. And so Jesus kind of meets his church, his bride, on hostile territory, thereby declaring what the scriptures also talk about, his triumphing over the principalities and the powers. And then what should happen once the church meets, once it becomes that apontasis to the descending and reigning Christ? Well, according to dispensationalists, according to left-behind people, Jesus does a U-turn, right? He doesn't come all the way to earth. He turns around and goes back to heaven and the church goes with him for seven years. But I hope you see how this clearly violates the image, the picture of this key technical term, apontasis. The natural way of reading the text is the church then escorts Jesus to the place he was always going, namely earth, the place from which they, the members of the delegation party, came. And so as I said, this verse, I believe, delivers a death blow to the idea that Christians will, or the idea that there'll be a twofold coming of Jesus. First, a secret coming in which no one will notice. Believers will just vanish and disappear. And then after a period of time, Jesus comes not for his saints, but with his saints. Instead, this passage, as indeed the rest of Scripture, speaks of a one-time return of Jesus, a one-time public return of Jesus of such glory and magnitude that all people, both believer and unbeliever alike, will witness and experience. Well, maybe you're still not quite convinced because you're thinking of yet another passage. You've got another text, and you want to interpret Scripture with Scripture, and that's a good thing. And you're thinking of Luke 17, where you see those words, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Now, at first blush, this may seem like a text that's opposed to my interpretation, because we've got two people, one is taken, it doesn't say raptured, but maybe we had that in mind, right? And the other is left or left behind. And we say, aha, see, that supports our idea of the rapture, that, wait a minute, one will be taken, raptured, that refers to Christians going to heaven for seven years, and the other left or left behind to experience the tribulation. But then before you too quickly interpret these two verses that way, you remember that important principle of every passage ought to be interpreted in its context. 
So that's why I included the larger context here in our PowerPoint slides. And so we backtrack just a little bit. We read the context, and it goes like this. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, so let's just stop there for a minute. Okay, Jesus is drawing a parallel. He's saying something happened in Noah's day, and that's what it will be like in the days of the Son of Man. Okay, so what happened in Noah's day? Well, in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving up in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Who are the them there? Well, it clearly from the context refers to the people who were eating and drinking, marrying and giving up in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark and the ones who knew nothing about what would happen. Those are the ones who are then taken away, raptured, if you will. And what happens when they're taken away? Well, they're taken away to experience death. And then Jesus says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. So if you interpret this verse in its right context, so in Noah's day, those taken away... It doesn't say raptured, but if you want to use that verb, I'm willing to concede that we could. Those taken away, or if you will, raptured, those refer to unbelievers who end up perishing in the flood. And the ones who are left, or if you want to say in contemporary terms, left behind, that's Noah and his family who live. And so if you read the verse in its context, you ought to say, I want to be left behind. I want to be like Noah and those who end up living, not those who are taken away and dying. And so if you go back to the verse, this is how it should be really understood. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and then now I've added in my interpretation, away in judgment, just like those in Noah's day, in the flood, who were destroyed, and the other left, right, behind to live. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, again, away in judgment, like the unbelievers in Noah's day, and the other left. And I'm adding behind to live like Noah and his family. So, we go back to our original question. What about the rapture? Is it a biblical truth or is it a mistaken teaching? And I want to say yes and no. Not because I'm wishy-washy, but because I think the evidence of Scripture is quite clear. Yes, I am willing to say, because I believe the Bible teaches, that the church will be joined to Jesus when he comes again. And if you want to call that a rapture, that's entirely fine with me. In other words, somehow when Jesus comes again, there'll be a separation between those who belong to Jesus and those who don't belong to Jesus. And that's a wonderful comfort for Christians to think about as they look ahead to the return of Jesus. One day the church will be, as Paul says, with the Lord, right? forever, both living and, un- and, and the ones who have died will be resurrected and transformed. Believers, uh, both living and deceased, will share in the glory of being joined with Jesus as his return. But no, the Bible doesn't hear, nor anywhere else, teach about this sudden disappearance of the church, the rapture of the church to heaven for seven years, after which then it returns to participate with Christ in the thousand-year millennial reign. In fact, if you know a bit about this teaching, no one believed this until really the, 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 the late 17th and early 18th century. It wasn't until uh, in England and then some Plymouth Brethren uh, Christians from England carried it over to the United States and where it took root and it became the popular teaching that it is today. Well, friends, I hope that this teaching on the rapture has been helpful for you. I hope that it's been helpful that if you've maybe uh, bought into a a particular view of the rapture, that this will force you to reevaluate your position and, and examine carefully what does the Bible actually say. I also hope that this discussion has illustrated for you how important it is to carry out a reformed hermeneutic in our interpretation of Scripture, whether it's this passage or any passage of Scripture how we involve all those elements, grammatical, literary, historical, and theological, in order to clearly and accurately hear what God was saying to the church then and there, and therefore also what God is saying to us here and now. 
But perhaps most important, regardless of whether you find this teaching convention convincing, the most important part with regard to the rapture is, um, is whether or not you know that you belong, body and soul, and life and in death to your faithful Savior, and you know that you'll be with Jesus when he returns. It's my prayer that it's that conviction that gives you comfort as you think about this idea of Jesus returning in glory. Thank you for your time and your attention.